My name is uh, Marty Klaassen and uh, welcome to another edition of uh, Light Talk. My guest today is uh, Andrew Tangsmith, associate partner at Woods Baggett, uh, one of the big architectural design firms in the world. And I'm really pleased to, uh, to see you again and to have this chat with you. Yeah. Welcome. Oh, it's, it's been, it feels like it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, last time we worked on this project together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought that would be also a good idea to, to have this chat and, and get an architect's point of view on, uh, on lighting. But first of all, uh, I would love to um, let our viewers know a little bit more about who is Andrew <laughs> and what does he do and what's your journey? How did you come to be here? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, obviously, um, I, I look after the Perth studio a lot, a lot from a design point of view, um, but I'm one of the design leaders here and yeah. um, I started off in Beijing, so far away, you know, kind of where my roots, roots were. Yeah. Um, and I was there as part of a, a kind of a scholarship, would you say, a like government-run scholarship. Right. Um, so it was an internship to get into Woods Baggett and straight out of uni, I was kind of didn't know what to expect, right. um, but basically worked, you know, got, got over there and worked really hard, um, did a good year yeah. of internship and um, yeah, basically came back to Perth and they said, yep, yeah, you can work yeah. here full time, which is great. Right. Um, and I've been kind of doing a bit of traveling. So with Woods Baggett, what's been really great with the big firm like this is that even though you're, you might have a kind of a studio that is, you call your nest, right? Yeah. You, you have the opportunity to go to Dubai or to, so for instance, yeah. being to Dubai, San Francisco, Melbourne, you know, a lot of the Australian cities. Um, did a bit of work back in China again the second time in 2015 yeah. again. Yeah, I remember um, that. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's quite nice in the sense that you, you kind of feel like yeah. it's, you know, home. But well, yeah. even for a company like us, you see, we, we also have offices oh, guys, in different countries You guys are mobile, world. yeah. And um, we deal with your colleagues in Singapore, Singapore for instance. Yes. Yeah, so yes. It's nice to be able to, to be in contact with offices around the world. Yep. Um, obviously, you have a, there's a certain design style and a sort of, certain yes. way that you guys work. Uh, and I find it quite refreshing to be able to work with your colleagues in Singapore, yep. with you here. Yep. Um, it's it's quite, uh, quite a nice uh, collaboration. Um, was architecture always what you wanted to do? Uh, I'm a bit of a cliche architect, yeah. where yes it was. I was a kid kind of making Legos and model planes and stuff. And um, I guess one, one of my big inspirations was um, my, my, my dad. So my dad... Um, he's an architect? Well, he's an interior architect oh. by trade, but he actually came from a, a kind of era in China where they didn't have design as, a, as an actual thing that you study and, and go for. So yeah. it was very, very tough back then. Yeah. Um, and so from his point of view, he actually fell into it. Um, he started off as a car smelting, you know, kind of factory. In right. the cars, yeah. And then he basically, there was a competition and mm. he loved the drawing cars. He was practicing right. drawing cars. And he actually put in into the competition, put, you know, put his sketch down. And then the, the, the key designer saw it, the lead designer saw it, and was like, you should be working as a design side. Right. Um, so he went to Japan and basically right. they trained him to be industrial designer. Okay. When he came back to China, they didn't quite have the work right. for doing car designs because he was yeah. kind of more designing like garbage trucks and buses and all of that. So it wasn't, it wasn't where his passion was at. So he basically self-taught interior design. Oh, right. Um, and inspiration for me because when I was a young lad, probably three or four or five years old, watching him just sketch the cars and do the, you know, using Copic markers um, was amazing because then it inspired me to want to be a designer like him. Right. Yeah, so to this day, oh, even since I was young, I always wanted to be a designer, yeah. yeah. So you've got roots actually in China. Yeah, my roots are in China, in Beijing, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Which also probably explains the stint that you have in, had in China. Yeah, it was a nice way to kind of get back to the you heritage speak Chinese? things. Yeah, well, can you speak Chinese? Yeah, well, can you speak Chinese? Very good, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, it was good because you just um, had the opportunity to go back and rediscover the hometown, or not even a town, it's a major city of 20 million people. Um, but yeah, basically. So, so you would have an ideal position to sort of compare um, life and work in China and life and work here. I mean, I've got it as well because and we you have know an office in Shanghai, yeah. so we worked about it. It's quite a contrast. You know, it's quite a contrast. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know that if you're working hard, you're playing hard. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of what goes hand in hand. Is yeah. It's but rules are a bit different here. Rules, and rules are, a bit are different very different. In China. So how you play the rules? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's a world of difference, and uh, sometimes we, you know, Chinese, they don't speak about design the way we do. They're more poetic. They 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 tend to speak in 
in, in philosophical yeah, terms. Yeah, more philosophical yeah. Yes. symbolism that's and right. things like that, that's right. right? So that's what resonates with them because like, you know, even taking something like feng shui and my dad would tell me about this through our, you know, conversations, you know, that we'd have. But um, feng shui is a philosophical way to explain yeah. science. Right, so it's you know we see it scientifically. We talk about the sun. We talk mm. about mm. you know airflow through a building, natural yeah. ventilation. We talk about where something should be located in relationship to water and right, you know right. sited. Whereas over there, feng shui is almost a kind of philosophical and it's spiritual an framework. Part of life. It is, it is. Yeah, yeah. But it's talking about the same thing. Where should the air come from? Where should you put your front door? All yes. of those things. It's yeah, quite yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So do you influence your colleagues in that respect in terms of feng shui? Because for me. I learned about feng shui when I arrived in Singapore yeah. 30, 35 years ago or something. Right. And <laughs> yeah. No, no, a long time ago, but okay. it was uh, a new world. Yes. I, I know yes. numerology, feng shui, yes. all these kind of things were like, whoa, what is this? Yeah, what is that? I mean, and then gradually you, you start to understand and you, you, you see that it actually makes sense and it, it's a real thing that has impact. It has, right? Yeah, it has tangible impact to the way people live, but it depends on how far you go, I think, with some yeah. of it. So, um, with definitely with the greater principles of like health wellness design, design yeah. for health. Um, obviously, we talk about it here. We don't necessarily frame it around feng shui, but yeah. it is the same thing. A lot of it is right. the same. You know, it's the same conversations around where does your front door go? You know, where is where is the entrance? You know, does that how does that relate to the cross ventilation, yes. natural ventilation of where the prevailing winds are? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Obviously, you can't follow. The exact feng shui principles because they are actually designed for China or Asian, you know. Yes, of, yeah, where but they are. I, I yeah. can tell you, I've had a couple of projects where we actually had a feng shui expert, a master, in, yeah, and he would just tell us no, yeah, and does it matter what you as a designer think yeah. if the feng shui master says no? It's no. I, I think right? there's definitely another industry around that that has been involved. <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah, the most funny thing that I remember from this guy in one particular project that when he invoiced, yeah. His invoice was ludic ludicrous. Yes. In terms of, <laughs> was ridiculous. And then, but he defended it and said even his invoice was feng shui related. I, he couldn't change the number and the amount of the invoice he because a, that was all related to the feng shui. Probably had the right number of, yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah, in odd uh, numbers yeah. or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, I, I need to, to talk about lighting yes, because that's, yeah, that's why yeah. we're here and uh, I want to understand a little bit your. your point of view, mm -hmm. what do you think? So what's, do you remember looking back when, when was the first time you really got in touch with lighting and, and you realized yeah. that lighting meant something? Yes, absolutely. Look, I think um, just kind of as a child, um, you know, when you're going into a space, whether it's a, it's a supermarket or whether it's a, a place that feels a lot more warm and like a hotel lobby, you know, the sense and the color temperature of the light really changes the mood that you're in. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're in a harsh light condition, like, you know, as a kid, like kids know it, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah now with kids myself, like, yeah. you know, you can understand that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely as a young child, but from a project basis, um, it would be the um, Perth Airport. Mm. So that was when we were actually starting to work with lighting designers right. um, and working around how do we actually achieve the, you know, the greatest outcome around lighting, but then also how that integrates with the design of, you know, the, the architecture and the envelope and the yeah. internals and, um, you know, then how it actually highlights certain things that you want people to be drawn to and how yeah. it creates wayfinding yeah. elements and, yeah. Um, yeah, how light, you know, kind of falls through a veil or, you know, bounces around within a kind of, you know, frosted glass wall. Mm. Yeah, all those elements. Yeah. 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 I think as an, architect, you, an ar as an architect, you need to understand how lighting impacts because lighting, I sometimes say that lighting is the glue that gels everything it is, together. It's, but it if is. you don't understand the importance of lighting and how lighting can really reinforce your message as an architectural yeah. uh, designer and, and how it can reinforce your concept, uh, I think it's crucial to understand that. You, you take this building, for example, yeah. the heritage facade is beautifully articulated from yeah. you know the Federation Free Classic style. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to appreciate it unless you had the lighting at night time, yeah. you know, to really yeah. bring it out, bring out yeah. the details. So yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask about this project okay, anyhow. Okay. <laughs> <We're segueing laughs> since, <in>. <laughs> <laughs> since we have worked on this project yeah. together, so what is what is your, your let's say your takeaways from from working together? Um, you know, we, we we met basically for the first time yes. on this on this project a couple project, of years yeah. ago, and um, I, I could feel your enthusiasm for lighting, and you supported us throughout the project, which yeah. which we really appreciated because. Not always do we find architects that are supportive, strangely enough. Yeah, right. Yeah. But uh, you were definitely there and, and supported the whole idea. But so what 
what did you take away from our collaboration in terms yeah. of lighting? I, I love the fact that um, you know you were working hand in hand, mm. um, and it was design thinking mm. happening together. Mm. It was not about uh, lighting being its own thing. It was lighting being integral, and it was a layer right. as part of the experience. Right. Um, but then also the kind of way that we collaborated together, and the way that you used to hand draw some of these little lighting concepts, yes, and yes. you know how does it work? The sketching together was really amazing. That kind of process. Um, and then one of the other things that resonated was just how you actually layered lighting in when you were presenting. Yes. You know, it's like, it was this, then it was this, then this lights up and that did that, you know. It makes it clearer, right? It makes it very yeah, clear yeah, and it yeah. tells the story of why we're doing the way we're doing. Yeah. And then, you, you know, there's all of yeah. these things that contribute to lighting, yeah, yeah. including the, the internal lights and the yeah. street lamp light that comes on and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. To, yeah, it, it, is, it is for us, an educational yes. pro process as well, because yeah. we need to take our clients and, and yourself by the hand and mm -hmm. explain how we arrive at our final concept. Because mm -hmm. I can just show you a final render, but it's not easy to understand what no. the different layers are. That's so right. building it up and, and making you understand where the lights are, what the lights do, and why we have well, a light there yeah. is really yeah. crucial because then, then it also makes sense to you. Because if you take one element away, you go, oh, something's missing. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, it, it was really enjoyable. Mm. Um, yeah, in general, um, I, I mean, you, you work with, with many other uh, consultants uh, in, in, in your career and, and um, in, as, a, as an architect also. Um, do you have any specific challenges that you always come across when it comes to lighting? Things you are, so, you know, you know it's coming and then still it doesn't work out or mm. typical challenges yes. that, that you come no, across? I think it's, it's actually a really important one. So um, obviously working with um, consultants within the engineering field, mm. um, they're great in terms of helping us understand you know what it is to meet the compliance elements mm. but when it comes to design of lighting and the mood of the space to achieve an mm. ambience mm. Um, you, you sometimes find you get to a point and you go oh when it's built and you go why was this light temperature not mm. thought about a little bit more yeah it's you know like those things doesn't yes. get picked up yeah by by some consultants that are not yeah. within the field of design yeah. um, and so I found that to be very important because yeah. those pro projects got built and then you look yeah. and you go well if that was the right lighting design, it would have made a big difference to how that space is felt internally, but also perceived outside yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. to us, um, creativity is also really important, yeah. you know, because we can engineer looks level designs, yes. but it's not what you see. And it's, it's the way you can appreciate the space and how lighting is somehow seamlessly integrated that I feel is the most important thing. It's not about the lighting, it's mm. about how the lighting integrates in the overall space. And mm. when you enter the space, it's not like, wow, look at the lighting. No, it should be like, whoa, look at this space. Yes, right? yeah, that's right. That's right, mm. it's hand in hand, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's the ability to anticipate, I think, what is going to make a space look great. And obviously lighting is part of it, but yeah. it's also the interaction with what you uh, and interior designers decide in terms of material finishes, mm. color schemes, uh, spatial layouts, uh, all that, you know, has an influence. And that's a very good point, because I remember we were selecting certain materials and colours for the airport project, and the lighting designer on that project would say, well, this is going to affect the lighting. Mm. And, and likewise, for another project that we're doing in mm. South Perth with another um, lighting designer, is, you know, very, very, making it very clear that mm. if this is too dark, it's not mm. going to pick up the light that they're yeah. trying to make. Well, OK, well, you know, yeah. we need to make those adjustments, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a crucial role that mm. we have mm. is to at least highlight the impact mm. of what lighting can have yes. on materials, material finishes, yeah. etc. That's right. Uh, absolutely. That's right. No, I, yeah. I know that. Like it's it's hands uh, down. really important. <laughs> um, so when you mean you're getting a request for proposals all, all the time, um, and then somehow along the way, a lighting designer needs needs to get involved. Yep. I mean, it's still something that not all clients appreciate, but uh, you, yeah. I know, do appreciate that very much. Um, what would you say would be the key role of the lighting designer in that whole process? How would you put, position them? Mm. Because sometimes I feel that by the time we get appointed, um, we are too late in the piece. Yes. You know, it's already yeah. way advanced and anything that we suggest uh, may already be difficult to achieve. Yeah. Somehow, depending on the project and, you know, it depends on the, it very much depends on the context around the project and the size and scale of it. Some of the clients see lighting design as optional, but it sometimes might be extremely important because it's public. Mm. We're talking about public realm here. We're talking about public plazas yeah. and all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's just sometimes hard to con conceive that they have this attitude to it. Um, but then, you know, and this, is, this could be one particular client that has this particular attitude. So um, it, it, sometimes what would potentially help in that case is to actually show them mm. what it is. Mm. And so doing some kind of small piece, it right. might be, you know, kind of sharing the project with you and going, look, there is this project. Yeah. We are looking at thinking that lighting, will, well, lighting's gonna have to play a big part of this, but mm. we can't do it alone. Mm. Um, what can you do with this image mm. that maybe be able to tell the client the story of lighting that can yeah. be done in a different way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so therefore it gives them a teaser of what the value could be that mm. you know, the rest of the consultants cannot do. Yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Well, the other thing that, that probably plays a very big role is the enormous evolution mm. of the lighting technology. Yeah. I mean, when I started, I literally only walked the fluorescent tubes and incandescent lamps, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Look at where we are today. Yeah, absolutely. And nowadays, the new generation doesn't even know these kind of light sources because you can hardly get them That's anymore, right. if at all. So it's all about LED technology. Yeah. And from my point of view, it has had an enormous impact on the way we design because I had to relearn, I had to reschool myself. Yeah. Because what I thought I knew about lighting was thrown out of the window, of more or less, yeah. because LED lighting um, um, reacts and, and produces light in, in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has had a very big impact because, of course, it's a very compact technology, a very efficient technology, mm -hmm. something that you could integrate yep. in building materials. That's right. So I would imagine that uh, you also have something to say about what LED technology has done for you as terms as an architect. Uh, look, I think it's, um, in essence, it gives you more flexibility and freedom, mm -hmm. um, you know, integrating it in ways that allows it to be concealed or very discreet. Yeah. Um, the technology, you know, in terms of the thin, thinness of the lighting fittings itself yeah. allows you to you know create more effective and efficient ways mm. to design mm. um, but I think what's really good is just the fact that it's sustainable like yeah. in terms of you know the fact that you know they've got long you know long lifetime yeah. um, and it's just you know much more better for the environment overall so right. that can yeah. only be a good story yeah yeah it is it is um, I mean not that we have a lot of choice because it's nowadays the only yes. technology that's sort of made made available to mm. us but um, as a lighting designer, I've gone through that whole development from incandescent to compact fluorescent yeah. and now we're in, in LED and even within the LED, mm -hmm. uh, we are already in, in stage three or four in terms yeah, of you know, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, version five, six, seven, etc. like like iPhones. Yeah. That, that, no, but that's the <laughs> sort true. of speed of development. That is, that is true. But um, uh, talking about uh, iPhones, um, that brings me to the fact that there's another element that is creeping in yeah. uh, in, in our designs, and that's uh, smart technology. Of course, of right? Course, yes. uh, everybody talks about data, data yeah. collections. Yeah. How can I integrate that? Mm -hmm. um, you're probably aware that, that we have developed our line design of things platform. Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you see that from, from your point of view as an architect? What, how is data, data collection, mm. smart IoT going to influence mm, mm, mm. the design and the way yeah. we are moving forward? Well, I think it, I think it maybe relates something about um, again maybe there is an element of being more efficient in terms of power saving so yeah. um, understanding um, you know kind of communicating having that kind of feedback I guess in terms mm. of how people use the space yep. and then being yep. able to react to that in yep. a smart way um, you know the idea of uh, wellness in terms of circadian rhythms mm. and you know color temperatures changing based on time um, yep. time of day again that's all very kind of technology that we know about now mm. already what's in the future? I mean, I don't know. I guess I have to rely on you to tell me, Martin. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, what, what we are saying uh, from our research and our mm. practical experience so far is that while in the past, uh, maybe 10% of a light fitting was intelligent yep. in terms of a little sensor here and there yep. and its controllability or wireless controllability, the way it's moving is that the future will be 90% smart and maybe 10% lighting. Just like your mobile phone, you don't buy your mobile phone for the phone function, that's you true. buy it because of all the smart so, functions. So what else could it do then? What else could a fitting that smart do for us? Well, we, we are talking about uh, Bluetooth networking, yes. uh, uh, GPS yes. positioning, yep. voice control. So they, they become like sensors for other it elements. It becomes yeah. a data entry yeah. point, basically. Which is great because, you know, they talk about 5G technology, um, you know, having the ability for these elements mm. to be little, you know, sensors or data points yeah. that picks things up. Yeah. So I think like if you were to, you know, kind of array across a city 
and have these pick up certain other de data entry points, you know, it basically allows it to form the network of a smart well, the city. The thing is right? that yeah. what, what happens in a building, you can, you can measure it, mm. right? You can record data, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about physical yeah. camera yeah. type of uh, recordings, but, but how people move, move. in space, yeah, which areas are they using. That's Maybe right. you'll find out that Hot this spot. space where mm -hmm. we are in right now is only used once a week. No, absolutely, right? absolutely. So why do you have this space? So to integrate that into lighting right? makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then uh, that relates back to air conditioning, That's right. to lighting, Uses, to yeah. air quality, yeah. all these kind of things, right? I think Noise the levels. The feedback's gonna be amazing because you're suddenly looking at how you design um, spaces to be more flexible yeah. and adaptable. Yeah. And so therefore they almost become this multi-modal right. space yeah, that yeah. you know adapts over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now we know like the markets are completely changing all the time, you know, retail shrinks in certain times, you know, commercial you know, expands but then shrinks because of, you know, pandemic, um, residential is doing, potentially doing well right now, but, you know, at different parts of the world things change yeah. and so therefore for the ability for buildings to adapt and interiors to adapt yeah. based on sensors and how and a feedback loop, yeah. you know, is, is established. I think it's the next big thing. Right? We, we yeah. had one project uh, just not so long ago where the client is planning to build a new head office. Yep. But they're still in their old building. Yes. And they installed a number of sensors yep. uh, and data collectors in order to understand how their current space was being used, mm -hmm. including meeting rooms, yep. including social areas yeah and that data collection was then used as an input for their new, the head, new office. head office like they had meeting rooms yeah. for for 20 people they had meeting rooms for just four people mm. they found out that some of these meeting rooms were used for lunch mm -hmm. <laughs> yes uh, yeah, yeah when they weren't desi designed for it originally yeah and, and yeah. Um, they for instance also discovered that some areas near the windows were not used a lot yeah, for yeah, some reason. Yeah. So they got a lot of information out of that and that has helped drive the new design for the headquarters. And I think, and I think what's so interesting about that is that, um, you know, because our, our business with Spagger has got this, um, got this other, other partnership with another, um, with ERA. I'm not sure if you mm -hmm. heard of ERA. Um, and ERA basically looks at, you know, kind of evidence-based yes. design yeah. Yeah, yeah. and research and applies it through computational, you know, design yeah. processes mm -hmm. um, and basically understands, you know, behavior, pulls big data in yeah. and then allows that to actually work with the design team to actually mm -hmm. come to some yeah. of these solutions. Yeah, it helps the clients visualize these elements, helps the clients understand these beha behavioral mechanisms. Yes. Yes. Um, so therefore, you know, it's, it's really about the data that they receive first. Right. They're able to kind of translate that yeah. to give it to the design teams. Um, but the data collection yes. is the part is that is not quite there yet. Yes. Um, and, and I remember this one instance where um, as part of Studio X, which was something that was co-run between Woods Bagot and Columbia University, right. um, I went to Shenzhen for that. Right. And we basically ran it with ERA, our, mm. our kind of computational design side of ERA, right. Open Systems. Yeah. Um, and it was basically about collecting data from these, what they call urban villages. Right. Right. Okay, so yeah, the urban yeah. villages of Shenzhen, which were these yeah. densely packed, um, you know, four or five story high buildings that were kissing each other almost, yes, only yes, about yes, one yes. meter difference. Yes. Um, and these kind of network of laneways in the ground plane and mm. almost kind of like mice scurrying around through these yeah, things yeah, yeah. as you walk through. Um, the students from Columbia University were there to actually data mine and understand, oh, really? okay. you know, how yeah. certain elements like alleyways, right. um, certain elements of kind of nooks and all that. And There's a logic right, in yeah, there, right? Yeah, yeah, and how many doors there were, yeah. the intensity of yeah, windows yeah, and the aspect yeah. ratios yeah. of buildings changed the way that behave, yeah. people move through. And um, we had the data collected by them, yeah. but the, the, you know, obviously the, the process and the outcome is only as good as the data that's collected first. Well, that's with all designs. Your, your final results is as good as uh, yes. your design concept and how much time you spend that's to do right. the actual implementation. That's right. But I, I mentioned data because data needs an infrastructure to be connected to, mm -hmm. and that uh, turns out to be lighting. Yeah. Um, the, the way things are developing is that the lighting infrastructure of the future will be also the backbone mm -hmm. for all data collection mm -hmm. because we know where the lighting is. It is in every single space that yeah, we design. That's right. It is connected. Yeah. It is wired. Yeah. It's, uh, so um, that makes it an ideal host for all data infrastructures. And one of the things that we see as lighting designers, and that's why we talk about light design of things, is that we see that integration between architectural lighting and IoT. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. uh, that's happening. And yeah. that's also something that I feel uh, architects uh, and interior designers are starting to get a, a feel for that you don't need this separate infrastructure for data collection. You don't need a separate set of sensors. This no, is, it's integrated. Know, it's integrated. It makes sense. It makes yeah, sense that's, to me. That's where, yeah. we, where we're going. Awesome. That's now, awesome. I, I also have to touch, of course, on uh, the situation the world is in right now, the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> because that <laughs> undoubtedly is going to have some impact on, if not a lot of impact, on, on how we will design for the future. We Absolutely. see it within lighting. Yeah. Uh, we see that um, things like ultraviolet mm -hmm. uh, disinfection is, is coming up mm -hmm. and, and, and other uh, steps are being taken. Mm -hmm. um, do you see anything from architectural point of view, social distancing, the mm -hmm. way you mm -hmm. design things? Uh, maybe oh. we're even too close now, but yeah. we're, we're in, <laughs> in, in an Australian in environment Australia, where, yeah. where we are quite all right. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, in a way, Martin, like, it's a constant conversation that we're having now uh, with our clients mm -hmm. amongst ourselves. Um, we've been doing a lot of thought leadership around, it, uh, around mm -hmm. this, and there's been quite a few articles that we've been releasing recently around right. it. Um, you know, and it, it kind of spans different sectors. Yeah. Uh, you know, around you know whether in residential or multi-residential, should we say, mm -hmm. um, about adaptable living within you know yeah. an apartment, right? Yeah. An apartment that basically flips between living and work because a lot more people are yeah, starting course, to, yeah, was. you know, do, you know, with obviously the advent of technology we now, and we all have discovered working yeah, from te home. teams and working from <laughs> home and, and Zoom, right? Yeah. So um, the ability for that to happen within a small and efficient space, to have this kind of apartment that can adapt mm. to that, um, was one of the things that were, we, you know, we were exploring and, and putting out as a bit of a thought leadership piece. Oh, right. um, you know, other one is, is a very kind of obvious one, but you don't think about it right now, is, you know, traveling in the future, what, airport, what airports are going to be like in the future. Um, the idea of a kind of seamless journey through airports that are more experiential, putting passenger experience first almost feels like you're coming into this space that is more about lifestyle yeah. and more about kind of inhabiting the space, mm. um, whether it's, again, a mixed use kind of food and beverage, you know, kind of element. But what it does is that it breaks down the barriers of security yes. so that you're actually almost having your secure point at the end, but yes. your luggage is kind of taken, you know, before you even leave, so you don't have to worry about the kind of check-ins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's making it a much more seamless and yeah. better experience. But at the same time, along the way, you're mm. having less the need to interact you know, with kind of luggages changing these things and going through security elements. So it's kind yeah. of trying to, um, you know, looking at how do we actually start to take away, you know, basically a post-pandemic era, you know. You're talking about taking away less. human contact. Well, it's not necessarily human contact in the sense that it becomes something where someone's intruding into the space and having to search you. No, but, well, I, I you know, always had technology. already yeah. issues with, with the self-check-in booth where you don't, <laughs> you don't talk anymore to someone behind the counter. Well, it's like, that's, you know, that yeah. whole personal yeah, I, I hear interaction. You. I, I hear that. you. I hear yeah. you. Look, I think human interaction is going to be really important. And if anything, it's going to be allowing for human interaction to happen in other modes, like, you know, like hospitality was, you know, yeah. like people being more hospitable than rather than kind of that nervousness of, going through security mm -hmm. and then the security guard going, oh, you know, have you taken your belt off? Or, you know, did you take your shoes off? You got to go back. That kind of rush, yeah. you, you become much more relaxed because that's being made a lot more seamless yes, through yes. technology and through these processes so that you can actually be greeted by almost someone like a concierge or whatever, you know, and yeah, be yeah, taken yeah, on yeah. a bit of an experience. It's about elevating the passenger experience, I think, is what this piece was exploring. Um, and obviously workplace is a huge one. We are now, um, you know, getting into that post COVID situation, yes, yes. Uh, and hopefully some of the things that, that you have been mentioning will, will possibly uh, happen. Um, I, I look back and, and, and look at how things used to be. I mm. don't think that we'll get back to there anytime no, soon. No. Um, I mean, for somebody like me who used, used to be in a plane every week, Yes. Uh, this has been yes. a very interesting experience. How's it felt, Martin? You're actually grounded now for once. <laughs> oh, guess what? I, I go camping <laughs> and I go bush nowadays. But isn't that the great thing about what, it what this has happened? Yeah, it is, of it's, course it yeah, is. It is. It's so kind of grounded us all. Yeah. I think uh, it's very hard to look into the future, but uh, one thing that I, I do know is uh, I'm sure we'll see, it, see each other again yeah. in the future. Yeah. Thanks very much for this interview, uh, well, we're glad Andrew. To have you back and, uh, in post, it was Martin. my pleasure. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha.